the afternoon. Um, the afternoon part. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Anna Maria Castrobe from Northeastern University. And she's going to tell us about bilateral geometry of M0 n bar. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor to speak in this conference, and it's always a great pleasure to visit Stony Brook. Um, so I'll talk about some uh, joint work with uh, Genia Tavolev. And it will be about the birational geometry of a very particular variety. Uh, so namely the moduli space of stable and pointed rational curves, M0 and bar. Okay, so, so among the delin mumford moduli space of stable curves with markings, this is the simplest, uh, not only because of the object that it parameterizes, trees of P1s with markings, um, but also it's a smooth, fine moduli space that has a very concrete uh, description. It has several concrete descriptions, one of which is due to Kapranov, and it's uh, as a blow-up of a projective space. So M0 M bar is isomorphic to a blow-up of Pn minus 3 along general points, n minus 1 general points, P1, Pn minus 1, and linear subspace is spanned by them. Okay, and so perhaps because of this very explicit description, uh, we feel like we should know everything about it. So, uh, so we want to know what is the Mori cone of effective curves what is the effective cone of divisors. But uh, as it turns out, these are actually uh, open questions starting with n equal 8. And we don't even know if these cones are rational polyhedral. And so, uh, so related to that, uh, there was a more specific question of who and Q. Uh, in their paper where they introduced more regime spaces, they also asked if M0 and bar is a more regime space. So the question of who and Q is if M0 and bar is a more dream space. So I'll recall the definition in a second. Um, essentially, this says that the Mori program works for any divisor, uh, meaning like you replace the canonical class with any divisor, and uh, uh, you can make, therefore, any effective divisor nef on some model. So to be precise, let's, uh, let me say that the, let me say, recall the definition. So all the varieties I'll talk about will be projective, uh, normal, Q factorial. So we say that such a variety is a more regime space. So I'll abbreviate this uh, MDS. If the following conditions are satisfied, first of all, we want linear equivalence of divisors to be numerical equivalence. Um, so. And then we want uh, all, nev all nev divisors to be um, semi-ample. So existence of morphisms contracting uh, faces of the Mori cone is just a combinatorics issue about looking at the right class, so the morphism will exist. So, uh, saying that the nev cone is finitely generated by uh, semi-ample divisors. And then a more complicated looking condition, which essentially says, as I said, that uh, that uh, divisor becomes NEF on a model. Uh, so this says that, that there are finitely many Q factorial small modifications. So I'll abbreviate these SQMs. So let's call these XI maps fi, so these are isomorphism in co-dimension 1, such that when you pull back nef divisors from xi, you fill up the entire movable cone of x. Uh, okay. I have to continue this here. So such that, uh, such that 
we can see the cone of movable divisors. This is a union of uh, pullbacks of nav cones of these xi's. And well, also, we want the xi's to have the, uh, the same property that the, their nav cones are finitely generated by some ample divisors. Uh, OK, so this is a, uh, so yeah, it's equivalent that uh, the, the Mori program works for any divisor. And there is an algebraic way to characterize more dim spaces in terms of uh, section rings. And that is, again, due to Fu and Kiel. So X is a more dim space if the Cox ring or the total coordinate ring is finitely generated. And again, just to recall, uh, if you, um, so the Cox ring or a Cox ring is given by the multi-graded ring that you get by picking a set of, set of generators for the Picard group or the divisor class group and looking at the corresponding uh, sections. Okay, so here. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So the prime examples here are toric varieties, uh, for which Cox proved that, uh, that these rings are polynomials if you consider the boundary divisors as their generator. Uh, so examples, uh, toric varieties. Then more generally, uh, Lokpano varieties are more ordinary spaces because of um, the Karka, Shini, Haken, and McKernan results. This was a con conjecture of Huang Kiel, which they proved for threefold. And then, uh, aside from that, there are many modelized spaces which are known to be modeling spaces. Basically, whenever you have a, um, whenever you can vary stability, then you get many birational models, and then you're uh, left to show that okay, maybe what you have is everything. But there is no, there is no uh, structure theorem for modeling spaces. There are some some things you can say. Read this as a remark. It's easy to see that. Uh, if you take a small modification of a Moradin space, you get the Moradin space. This is, uh, yeah, so small modifications of the same Cox rings. And then uh, um, images of Moradin spaces are also Moradin spaces. This is a theorem of Okawa. Okay. And. Um, so now, so that's, that's about it, you can say. Uh, there are some simple constructions that take you out of the, this category of Morning spaces very easily, such as taking P1 bundles or blowing up. Um, OK, so back to M0 and bar. Yeah, so for n equal 5, um, this is a del Pezzo surface. And I should say that for, for surfaces, to be a more ordinary space is equivalent to just the first two conditions because of Zariski's theorem. Movable divisors are semi ample. And so, where um, all del Pezzo surfaces have uh, the nef cones are generated by pencils of lines and conics, so that's easy to see. Uh, and then for n equals 6, this is a log fan of threefold. So, this is a more ordinary space by Hu and Kiel. But then, starting with 7, these are not log fan anymore. So you lose positivity of the anti-canonical class uh, very fast. Uh, OK, so then I should say maybe why, will, why was it, uh, what's the motivation behind uh, who and kills question? Um, so why do we expect that uh, uh, M0 and bar is a more ordinary space? Well, for one, you can uh, think of the stratification that all mobilized space of stable curves uh, have. The stratification is somehow reminiscent of the stratification of toric varieties. And you can ask, if are the strata um, relevant for the birational geometry in the same way? Uh, OK, now, this is a, I'm not sure anyone was expecting this is that mg and bar for large g behaves like a toric variety. Uh, in fact, it doesn't. So before even the Huang Kill paper, uh, Kiel proved that in 99 that uh, that mg n bar is not a more dim space in characteristic zero if g is at least three and then it's positive because it has a nef but not semi ample divisor. Okay, and then more recently um, is that uh, Choshkun and Dawei Chen they proved that 
M1 n bar has infinitely many extreme arrays in the affective cone, which uh, yeah, all modern spaces have all these cones that, ap that appear in my rational geometry are all polyhedral. Okay, but so for M0 and bar, maybe uh, a more compelling reason why you would expect it to behave like a toric variety is this Caprano description. So maybe let me go back to that. So, yeah, so M0 and bar is, is a blow up of Pn minus 3 along points P1, Pn minus 1, and linear subspaces spanned by them which we can fix up to the automorphisms of Pn to be just in coordinates, points where just uh, one coordinate is non-zero, and then the last one is 1, 1, 1. Okay, so you can, uh, uh, so this map to Pn minus 3, this blow-up map can be factored in many different ways. One way is to first blow up the first n minus 2 points and all the subspaces involving them, and then blow up what's left. So in this way, you're uh, thinking of M0 and bar as the blow up of a toric variety. So, uh, so Pn minus 3 blown up at the first n minus 2 points and subspaces. So this is a toric variety, which I will call the loss of money in space. Um, so this has a modular interpretation given by loss of money, but it's also a weighted, uh, it's a Hasset weighted stable curves. Um, bond like space. And in fact, all the intermediary spaces are also have that, that interpretation. OK, so yes. OK, so all right. Uh, so now again, from Okawa's theorem, there are some simple conclusions you can draw. Yes, if, um, if M0 and bar is to be a Mordian space, then any intermediate space here has to be also a Mordian space. The first n for which you would find something that's not a Mordian space uh, will give also the same statement for higher n's, just because of forgetful maps. Um, okay, so. Just to make sure that the blow-up orders points and then the strict transforms of order lines. That's right, lines, planes, and so on. Yes. Okay. You said if you do all but the last point, then it's torque. That's right. It's I mean, it's clear that uh, you have the open torus there. Um, um, this one, I mean. OK. So yeah, so let me maybe write down this remark that, uh, that if M0 and bar is a more linear space, then any intermediate, uh, any intermediate space that appears here is a more linear space. In particular, uh, the blow up of this toric variety that we have here, the loss of money in space, at the last point, which I will rename uh, E just to indicate that this is the, the identity of the torus. <laughs> okay, so this has to be also a Moridim space. It's the first space that you, that you have here when you, uh, the first intermediate space that you have here. Yeah? So this map factors through this. Okay. All right, and so the first thing you can prove here is a, a converse to this statement. Um, so M0 and bar behaves a lot like this blow up of the historic variety at one point. Uh, so the first theorem is that if the blow up of the loss of money in space of dimension one more is a more dream space, then also M0 and bar is a more dream space. Okay, so. Uh, you would like to say that there is a surjective map between these, but that's not true. Uh, what is true is that there is a small modification followed by a surjective map. So uh, I don't want to give too many details here, but uh, the idea is that you want to look at the natural projection from this point that you have from the projective space of dimension one more. And then uh, resolving that map involves constructing a small modification of this space and then a surjective map to M0n. So namely, yeah, so if you look at the P1 bundle given by blowing up the point E on a projective space of dimension one more, this is the P1 bundle, uh, pull back this P1 bundle to M0 and bar via the Kapranov map, call this P. Okay, and then, uh, uh, yeah, so we, this space lives somewhere here above this. 
So you have a so far a rational map, a birational map. Um, and then uh, you can think of the, the other points that you have here. Let's call them Q1, Qn minus 1, mapping to points P1, Pn minus 1 here. Uh, and then yeah, the linear spaces spanned by these points will be um, sections above the boundary divisors here. And then doing elementary transformations on this P1 bundle successively uh, will actually lead you to a, to a small modification of a, of a, of a blowdown here. So I'm saying you do several elementary modifications, elementary transformations, and somewhere here in the end, you get the P1 bundle that is a, a small modification of the blow up of this guy at all the uh, linear subspaces up to co-dimension at least three. And then, okay, blow up the co-dimension two spaces, you get a small modification. So, um, yeah, so I'm saying that ultimately you have a small modification followed by a P1 bundle map, which resolves this ra by rational map that we have. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Okay. So then, uh, um, so then, what what uh, happens is actually is that these uh, uh, loss of binding spaces blown up are actually not morphing spaces. If uh, n is large, in characteristic zero. Okay, so um, I should say here that the, the bound that we gave was um, 134. This was later on uh, improved by Gonzalez, Jose Gonzalez and Kale Karu to n uh, at least 13. Uh, so I'm not sure this is uh, still optimal, and I'm pretty sure this is not necessary, but uh, yeah, I can prove that. Sorry? Yes. So yeah, everything. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, M zero twelve is the first case, or you don't know. Oh. And uh, is there some kind of criterion when a blow up of a toric variety in one point is a? Yeah. So that's the uh, obvious question here. Um, so yeah, we do give a sufficient uh, criterion, but the only examples. Uh, that uh, for which that criterion apply are these spaces. So I don't know other, I see, let's say, simpler, simpler toric. So I mean, yeah, that's a natural question. Find the simplest toric uh, variety, which blown up at the general point. Let's say smooth fano, maybe, uh, that blown up at the general point is not a more in space. I, mean, I don't know an example like that. But yeah, so indeed, that was uh, the starting point. What is the lowest dimension? Uh, it's, well, if you allow a uh, uh, singular, then it's uh, these weighted projective planes that I'm going to just talk about next. <laughs> so this is actually was the starting point here. Was okay. Uh, so this was this is like a question that uh, was sitting around for a while. Okay, take a general point on a toric variety, blow it up. When is that a morning space? When it's not? So the only examples that uh, that we knew where it happens that it's not a morning space is when the toric variety is a weighted projective plane. And that, so that, that's what I'll talk about next. But those are results that are old of like 20 years. Um, um, and yeah, it was a problem that uh, algebra is was, were interested in for different reasons. Another question. So you, you mentioned that M bar 0 n is not log panel. So what about loss of money? Uh, all toric varieties are, are uh, log funnel. Okay. All right. So, so the theorem that gives you this, together with this uh, 
uh, 20-year-old result is the following, that if you, so the idea is to relate uh, the, this toric variety to a simpler toric variety, although a singular one. So if you take uh, uh, integers a, b, and c co-prime, whose sum plus 8 is n, then if uh, the blow up of the Losefmanian space at the identity is a more during space, then the blow up of the weighted projective plane with weights a, b, and c uh, at the identity, again, is this is not a more during space. Sorry, it is a more during space. OK, and then. Then uh, there is this theorem of Goto, Nishida, and Watanabe from 91, which says that, uh, which gives an infinite sequence of uh, triples A, B, and C, for which this is not the case. So if A, B, and C are of the form 7m minus 3, 5m squared minus 2m, 8m minus 3, for m not divisible by 3 and m at least 4, then uh, the blow up of the weighted projective plane with weights a, b, c at the identity is not a modern space in characteristic 0. And it is a modern space in the positive characteristic. OK. Uh, so this is what, so if you take m equal 4, you get uh, 25, 72, 29, which if you add 8, you get 134. Now, this is the theorem that, um, that uh, was uh, uh, generalized by Gonzalez and Caro. So they have a very beautiful theorem that um, gives sufficient conditions on the A, B, and C for, uh, for this statement to hold. Uh, so I'll, I'll dis I hope to discuss later exactly what, his, uh, what their conditions are. The point is they, their conditions uh, include, uh, so this will be a corollary of their theorem, and they'll also find the smallest triple for which this is true. So let me just write it like this. So same holds for uh, 7, 15, and 26, which is the smallest known triple. And now you should... Uh, I mean, if you again add up uh, this and you get 8, you still don't get to 13. So I'll explain again how you can uh, refine uh, this theorem and bring down n. OK, so next I want to I wanna discuss a bit the, the proof of this theorem. So let me call this theorem 1. And then I want to discuss uh, the proof of these two theorems. So let's say this one. OK. All right. So the criterion uh, that I was mentioning before is included in this proof here. So you, you can, OK. So proof. Okay. So again, the point is you would like to say that uh, you would like to relate the two toric varieties. And you'd like, uh, love to say that there is a surjective morphism between them or between their blow ups. But again, that's not true. The next thing you can try is to, OK, maybe you can uh, find a small modification then followed by a morphism. Again, that, that seems hard. So what we're going to do is a sequence of small modifications and uh, surjective morphisms. So let's start uh, maybe gen more generally with the toric variety, any toric variety. And um, let's look at, uh, at the lattice. And it's the rays of the fan. So let me call gamma the rays of the fan. So now recall that the rays of the fan encode all the co-dimension one information. So two toric varieties with the same uh, lattice and rays of the fan will be isomorphic in co-dimension one. So let's. Um, so again, I want to get down to a lattice of rank two. So I want to get down to a toric surface. So 
let's say I start with, uh, with my lattice, let's say this has rank k, and then I want to consider somehow surjective morphisms uh, to lattices of rank 1 less all the way to, uh, to rank k, rank 2. And uh, I want to see what happens also with the uh, rays. So let's take the images of, of the rays that we have. OK, uh, so when you get down to, uh, to the plane, you see, uh, you see some rays in the plane. And so this is uh, the fan of a toric surface. And uh, now if it happens that among these rays you have uh, three that, that are uh, generated by vectors that uh, have uh, the weighted sum um, weighted by a, b, and c being zero, then you have a refinement of the fan defining the weighted projective plane. So that's, we would like to see that. So if you have such, yeah, so if you have such, um, so let me see. This is the first condition that you need, that if there are uh, u0, u1, u2 among our rays, uh, which generate the lattice, and such that their weighted sum is 0, then what we have is, uh, yeah, so this is, this is the fan that you have right here defines a toric surface xk minus 2, which will be then a, yeah, in this case, it will be the a toric <laughs> blow up of the weighted projective plane. Yeah, this you have a, uh, this is an isomorphism on the, on the open torus. Okay. So next, I would like to construct a sequence of uh, projective <coughs> Q-factorial toric varieties with data given by the lattices Ni and the rays given by gamma i. And for that, again, you need a technical condition that uh, for us will be satisfied. So let me just write down the condition that uh, when you look at the surjective map of lattices, this has kernel supported on array R of gamma i, and such that uh, plus and minus this ray are also rays in gamma i. Okay. Uh, so, so if you have this, then you can construct uh, a sequence of toric varieties which are with surjective maps between them. Okay. <coughs> okay, so uh, yeah, so you construct starting from the bottom up uh, These are going to be surjective maps, uh, and then yeah, this will be a projective Q-factorial uh, toric variety with data given by n i and some fan delta i, which is supported on the rays that we have. Okay, and so the one we start with has the same rays as uh, our starting toric variety, and so it's a small modification of that. And moreover, uh, now you can see what happens at the, when you blow up also. So the fact that this condition on the rays will tell you that um, when you look at one of these maps, uh, on the open torus, this is a trivial P1 bundle. 
So, so this is this is p. This is p1 times t, because of this condition that plus and minus are um, uh, are rays. So you will define your fan uh, in such a way. From cones, from here you add this extra ray. Uh, and now this is uh, this is just a projection. Um, you can even take it, take the affine space here, and so you're projecting. You're forgetting one coordinate, and then you want to see what happens when you also blow up the identity and look at the blow ups, and you're trying to resolve that rational map. So, okay, so I'm saying that if you look at now at the rational map that this induces, you're asking, how can I resolve this map? And so, this is really just resolving the projection. Um, Again, here you can do, uh, I mean, the, only, the problem is only locally on this, uh, around this identity point. Uh, so you can, again, do an elementary transformation, or you can do the problem, again, concretely, just changing coordinates, uh, change e to 0, and then you're, you have a toric problem, and you can do everything torically. So the point is that, yeah, you can, uh, uh, you can resolve this via a small modification, followed by a surjective map. So, so the upshot is that yeah, that if one of uh, these blow-ups is a Morgan space, then the next one must be a Morgan space, and you go that way all the way down to the way to project your plane. So I don't know how to do this in just one step, um, but okay, all right. And so okay, so this is the criterion. Uh, you need these conditions satisfied, and okay, so in the case of the Los Emanin space, you have. Uh, uh, now the question is, how are you going to choose these surjective maps? So there are many ways to choose them, and that's where there, is, there was room for improvement, and uh, Gonzalez and Caro did that to bring down the M, the theorem. So one way to project will give you this, uh, this theorem that I wrote before, about N equal being A plus B plus C plus 8. So, so one clean way to project, say, is, is as follows. So in this case, you have uh, the lattice is generated by vectors e1, en minus 2, subject to the relation that their sum is 0. The rays are given by sums, all the possible sums. So these do come in pairs, as in this condition. And, uh, and then, so one, as I said, one way to project is as follows. Consider a partition of your set 1 through n minus 2 to set a, b, and c of cardinalities uh, a, b, and c. OK, so pick an index from here, uh, one from each set, and then uh, kill all sums of vectors Ej plus Ei1 for all the Js from A, same for B, same for C. So what you get at the end is a lattice generated by three vectors whose weighted sum by A, B, and C is, is, uh, is 0. OK, so I'm saying that let's uh, project. Uh, so, um, so again, I'm, I'm going to project from, so I'm going to kill these kind of sums for any j in a, right? So that means uh, I'm left with just uh, a minus two uh, in each. Yeah, so, so this a, b, and c are different from those. Um, what do you mean? Um, no, it should be the same. So I'm saying, so take a, so when n is a plus b plus c plus 8. Uh, so I mean, if, if this condition, uh, n is a plus b plus c plus 8. A plus b plus, sorry, this is n minus 2. Uh, and this partition into, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, yes, yes, I'm sorry, yes, you're right. Sorry. Sorry, all right. OK. So, all right. All right. So, uh, 
yeah, so uh, so we project and you get uh, all the way to something uh, generated by the images of these vectors. Yeah, so if this is. Yeah, so this is my vectors. OK. OK. All right. OK. All right. So, so I'd like now to get to the, the proof of the second theorem or to the, uh, the question of when is the weighted projective plane blown up at the general point of merging space? So this is a very interesting question that is, that is not understood. And it seems like it's actually a very hard problem to answer completely. So the question is when is okay. So let me just introduce some notation. Um, so let's call I'll call P the way the projective plane, and then call X its blow up. And then if you consider the exceptional divisor corresponding to the identity point, and I'll call H the pullback of the ample generator of the divisor class group of P. OK, so just as a historical remark, yeah, the, the Cox ring uh, here is, a, is, a, is an extended symbolic Riesz algebra, and this is what um, uh, algebraists were studying. Yeah, so finite generations for these is uh, equivalent to the notoriety of this graded ring, and uh, so they were hoping. So if if these were if the ring is Noetherian, then um, uh, this monomial curve t to the a, t to the b, t to the c in A3 is a set theoretic complete intersection, and the hope was that this is always true until the Goto Nishida Watanabe results. Um, okay. So they were studying just basically this extended Ries algebra with uh, completely algebraic methods. So, so it was Kutkowski who actually uh, reinterpreted many of those results geometrically. And so to give a, a nice uh, partial answer to this question, so he says that, this is Kutkowski, says that if minus k is big, then x is a Mordin space. And uh, it's nice to compare this with the theorem of uh, Testa, Varilla, Alvarado, and Velasco, who proved that for rational smooth surfaces, if minus k is big, then the space is a Mordin space. So that's compatible. OK, uh, more specifically, you can make this a numerical condition. So if minus k square is positive, then minus k is big. So this just simply means a plus b plus c is greater than the square root of abc. OK. All right, so, so now let's, let's go a bit deeper into, into this question. Uh, I want you to know this is a Picard number two variety. So, and we, so we know one ray of the Mori cone here, which is given by the exceptional divisor. The question is, what is the other ray? So let's take the case when, when you have some other negative curve. And that's, that's the only case that, uh, that people understand. So all the results of Gonzalo Caro and Goto Nishida Watanabe are in that case, when you, when you have a negative curve. OK, so a lemma. Do uh, the Kutkowski or Huneke is that uh, let's assume that you have that. Assume A, B, and C are such that there is some curve C on X uh, different than E whose square is negative. Okay, 
Uh, so in that case, what does it mean to have a more ring space? So they say x is a more ring space if and only if uh, there is an effective divisor d such that d times c is 0, and c is not contained in the fixed locus of d. So with modern uh, reinterpretation, this is a, actually an easy result. Uh, so that's because, again, this is a Picard number two variety. So if you have a negative curve, then you do know the Morricone is generated by this curve C and the exceptional. The nephcone is dual to that, and then you only are asking, um, are the rays of the nephcone semi-ample? So we have H is here. Have somewhere here C. This is the Morricone. The dual of that is the nep cone. And uh, we do already know one ray is semi ample. It's the, uh, the map to the weighted projective plane. And then the only question is can you find a, a semi ample divisor along this ray? Uh, that's not quite that what, what that statement says, but, but it's immediate. Yeah, so, so I guess I'm saying that uh, from just from the definition of a modern space, you know that you just need a semi-ample divisor that can track this curve. Um, and so that's to say yeah, that, you can, uh, that you can contract only that curve. Um, the same way as you're contracting just the exceptional divisor here. So yeah, so how can something fail to be semi-ample? Uh, is uh, if it has a fixed part, the only possible fixed parts are C and E. It cannot be E, because that would bring you out of the nef cone, so it can only be C. So that's how these two are equivalent. And now it's also easy to see that when you have a negative curve uh, in positive characteristic, you can always find this divisor, because you have uh, Artin's criterion that tells you that um, if you have a negative curve, then you can contract it. If via projective morphism in, in positive characteristic. Okay, so negative curves in positive characteristic will always give you more than spaces. Okay, all right. Okay, so, so I'd like to maybe just say very briefly uh, a few words about how the Goto Nishida Watanabe argument went. And then I'd like to the, go to the to the proof of Gonzalez Caro. Okay. So the, the Goto Nishida Watanabe argument, uh, they find the, so for those particular set of weights, yeah, so A, B, and C are this particular type. Uh, the negative curve is, uh, is a one parameter subgroup, one of the simplest you can cook up, avoiding uh, powers of two. So this will be the negative curve. And then, um, yeah, so what are we trying to do? We are trying to look at the integer points along this ray. Yeah, so they are all multiples of one, one class. Yeah, so d times c is 0 is the same as d is congruent to one of these classes. And you're looking for a divisor that doesn't contain c in its fixed locus. Um, so you can look at the set of integers for which this is happening. So c not contained in the fixed locus. OK, so this set will depend on the characteristic of the field. And the really key. Um, observation, key theorem here is that uh, this set is always multiple of one of the smallest integer in it. Okay, so, okay, so we want to say that, uh, that there is a non-zero integer there if, if this is to be a modern space. But now uh, you have some, so they do a reduction to positive characteristic. 
So note that if you have something like, if you have a device, a class like this, then you can take a multiple and make it base point free. You can assume you have a smooth and connected curve in that linear system. So that's given by some equation, some polynomial, uh, you know, variables of some degree with some multiplicity at the identity point. Now reducing coefficients modulo p for general p won't change the class. So, so that means that once you have a d in the set, a positive d in the set, you will have one also for all the fields of positive characteristic if, if the characteristic is general enough. However, uh, now you can, so the result then follows from, uh, so you can prove, and this is what, what they do directly, that, that the class dp is always uh, satisfied this condition in characteristic p. So they construct an explicit polynomial that vanishes of the right degree, vanishing with the right multiplicity. Um, okay, and characteristic p is essential here. And then you can also see that that uh, the first integer class that you have along this ray, this is not going to be effective uh, in characteristic zero and in positive characteristic large enough. Again, this is like something very explicit. Yes, we have a polynomial of some degree, and you're, you're showing that it cannot vanish as multiplicity is three. But that's the point. Okay, so that's basically the argument. Okay, um, and yeah, the deepest result here is this one. Okay, which yeah has a if you uh, really look hard into it, you can find a geometric interpretation as a as a Max Noether type theorem for weighted projective plane. Okay, but it's an algebraic proof. Okay, all right. So so now uh, so there was a breakthrough uh, for this question due to Gonzalez Caro who. Uh, attack this problem with toric geometry methods. So they give sufficient conditions on a toric uh, surface of the car number one to have uh, the blow up at the general point not be a origin space. Okay. Okay, so. Okay, so let's start more generally with a polarized toric surface. Projective toric surface, so PCAR number one. Okay, so this corresponds to, uh, to a triangle uh, in the plane. A triangle with rational coordinates, which, yeah, so the vertices of this triangle I mean, this is living in the, you take the dual lattice, take the associated uh, vector space, and then uh, if you look at the local equations of this Cartier divisor, you see some uh, on the open sets corresponding to the, to, the, to the cones of maximum dimension, you see some points in this R2, and those are the vertices of this triangle. And now you can translate this triangle to make it pass through the origin, so if I have something like this. And now the sections of H are, uh, correspond to monomials coming from the rational points of this, of this triangle. Okay, and so, so the idea is let's uh, try to find a Let's look at, let's assume you have a negative curve with a simple equation. Let's again take it to be a one parameter subgroup. You can change coordinates, make it really to have a very simple equation. So, um, so let's say I can make my triangle to pass to the point zero one. So that means I can uh, look at the equation one minus y equal to zero. You know, so this is a section of this, of this age. Uh, and so I want this to be my, I want to impose that this curve is a negative curve on the blow up. Yeah, so let's call x the blow up of y at e. And I really want to take the proper transform of this. And I would like that. So that is now a class uh, of type h minus e. And I want that to be a negative curve. 
and now that's a combinatorial condition on the on the triangle, namely yeah, this is uh, a square minus one. This is the area of this triangle, which because I made it pass through this point, will be the width of this triangle. So I'll call this W. Yeah, if these are points x1, x2, this is just uh, x2 minus x1. And I we impose that this is negative. OK. And uh, now note that this curve will contain, yeah, so the, the vertices of this triangle correspond to torus invariant points. And uh, because the equation of the curve doesn't contain these two, uh, that means the curve actually passes through those torus invariant points. So there are three torus invariant points. It does pass, the curve passes through two of them. Um, OK, so one second. where these correspond to these vertices uh, x, i, y, i of the triangle. OK. So what does it mean now to have, um, to be able to, to blow down this curve? Right, so again, uh, uh, so to have d times c equal to zero, that's the same as having a, a, a semi-ample class of the form a multiple times h minus w e for some d positive. All right, and so okay, so now here's the the statement that again assume characteristic zero then x is not a monogene space. So I'm just going to reformulate the condition that this is containing in its base locus the curve C as follows. So for all uh, d sufficiently large and divisible, uh, if I take a polynomial with this class, so that means a polynomial of degree d, class dh, so this is some polynomial uh, aij xi to the yj for i and j in d times this triangle intersected with z2, vanishing to the right order at least d times w at e, then we want that not to be, we want that to contain the, the curve. So in other words, this must vanish also at the curve. Um, OK. But vanishing at the curve, so what, what does this really mean? It's, I claim it's enough to mean that uh, this polynomial will also, will also pass through, through one of the torus invariant points that C contains. So OK, so if D and C intersect, in zero on the blow up. Yeah, then that means that on the blow up, either D contains C in its fixed locus or it, in, or it doesn't intersect it at all. Uh, so that means that on the, on the toric variety Y, the only way these can intersect, if it doesn't contain C, is at this point that I'm blowing up. But if, it, if D will contain uh, a torus invariant point, that means that's not true. So it must be actually the whole curve must be contained in it. So it's, equi it's equivalent, really, to just say that, so this part is equivalent to just saying that the coefficient uh, AD, the leftmost coefficient, is actually 0. OK. All right. Uh, so I want to say now that, that this is coming down to, a, to an interpolation problem on points, integer points in the, inside this triangle. So I, I, I like this very concrete kind of question where, um, so this comes down to the following. Uh, so yes, yeah, so, okay. Uh, 
so this is equivalent, yeah, that x is not a more green space, is equivalent to finding a degree less than d times w curve uh, in A2, passing through all the points except the leftmost point. So that's an interpretation that you can give to the to the statement. Okay. And now the condition that they give, the sufficient condition for this to happen, can be reformulated um, essentially as follows. If you look at this triangle, uh, Okay, so they, they do formulate it this way, but then this part I'll, um, you, wanna, you can reformulate it. So, so he's saying, okay, uh, look at the second column to the right. Let's call n the number of points that you have there. Then you look at the first n columns here, and you request that in the nth column here you have exactly n points. And so n minus 1 in the next, and so on. So it's, it's kind of a strong condition, but, but not so strong since it includes so many examples. And then, okay, uh, so then, yeah, this condition is basically that you can find the degree n curve. Yes, yeah, so this is n, this is n, this is n minus 1, and so on. And so um, finding a degree n curve that passes through these n plus n plus n minus 1 and so on points, but not through this point. So that's exactly the right number of conditions, and so there will be a, just one curve like that. And okay, the condition doesn't pass through here. It's, again, some, some condition that on the next column here at the top, you don't have an integer a point of the lattice. So th that as geometric as it can get uh, for this, this sufficient condition that they give. Um, okay. So I think all the examples that are known uh, to fail this modern space condition will, will fall in this category. Okay. Um, so now the, the really fascinating question is like, what if uh, there is no negative curve? Now, um, so there is no example where it's known that there is no negative curve. Um, so there is a, so I should say there that, that, that if, uh, so let me just make this a remark, that if A, B, and C are such that their square root is uh, irrational, then if there is no negative curve, then uh, you have an irrational ray in the nap cone. And so it's definitely not a more green space, but it's more than that. It's more interesting because it's, it gives an example of an irrational Seshadri constant, which is, well, they are not known to exist. OK, so. So one example you can uh, try your hand at is uh, with A, B, and C to be 9, 10, and 13, where I think it's expected that it's, there is no negative curve. And you can, uh, again, reformulate this question to an interpolation problem, except, um, so what happened actually here, I forgot to say that. So this, to this degree and curve, you just add in all these lines. So it's a simple kind of curve. You only needed to interpolate uh, not really all the points in the triangle. Now, for if you are trying to prove that there is no negative curve, you basically will have to show that the points in your triangle will separate, will impose independent conditions. So you can separate any from the other by the right degree curve. Um, so in that example, you can check it for some, uh, I mean, and the thing is you have to take all the possible multiples. So for the first ones, you can do it, but it gets, it gets very, it seems it's a very hard problem. And as far as I know, in positive characteristic, there is no known example of a non mori dream space situation. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll stop here. <laughs> okay, are there any questions or comments on the talk? Okay, I have two announcements um, before.